All right, so it seems to be loading here, taking it a little while. Anyhow, uh, what we want to do is we want to create a program. And then uh, we have some various uh, shapes or fixtures um, that we're going to add inside of RoboGuide. So here's my robot. Okay, and apparently it did not save anything. So I'm just going to kind of walk through actually what we're going to do in the lab to some degree. And so remember the first thing you need to do, you notice how there's the Cartesian axis on the robot is all green. That means that the robot is not locked down. So we always need to make sure we lock that robot down so the thing doesn't move around on us, okay? The other thing that we wanna do in RoboGuide is to set our multiple panes here so that we can view the robot from various different angles. So we click on this and choose like a, a front view and a top view or whatever. You wanna just be able to, to look at it from multiple different views and zoom in on these as you need so that you can see from multiple different angles. Okay. So before I actually create a program, what I wanna do is create a couple of fixtures. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a fixture. And I'm going to create a box. And for some reason, when you create these box when you're fixtures, the software has them basically floating in the air. So they're actually three meters up in the air. So, you know, it's virtual software. So I guess boxes can just float. Okay. But uh, so I'm going to set the uh, size of this. I'm going to set uh, let me I'm going to check with the document here to make sure I get the sizes correct. All right, so we're going to do the X direction is going to be 400. The Y direction is 800. And the Z is 200. Okay. And then I'm going to place that at 1,400 and 200, okay? Now, as soon as I hit apply, you're gonna see that box come down and be uh, placed in here. So here you can see now is this box, okay? And if you notice the Cartesian uh, teach tool on here is right at the center of the box, but it's on the top of the box. And so that's like why I had to set the Z. I set the Z at 200 because the, the thickness of my box is 200. And if I have Z as zero, what it's doing is it's actually moving the box so that the surface of the box is level with the floor. And so the box is actually underneath the floor, okay? So, uh, so we've got this set here. And... <clears throat> I'm gonna change the color of it, make it kind of a darker brown color. And I'm gonna lock it so that it doesn't move, okay? So now I'm going to um, right click on, over here, right click on this fixture and I'm gonna copy it, okay? Um, don't know what I hit there. First, I'm gonna rename it. This is gonna be the brown box, okay? And then I'll copy the brown box. I guess I got to click on it and paste then. Paste brown box. So I have brown box one, which I'm going to rename to red box. 
Now notice uh, it put it a meter up in the air. So red, the red box is up here floating around and, but it's locked. So I have to unlock it and I'm gonna change a couple of these values. And so I'm gonna change the X value and I need to change the Z back to 200, okay? And I'm gonna change the color to red because I named this red box. And I'm gonna lock that, oops. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna lock it right this second. So I want you to look. So now you can see the brown box and the red box are basically right beside each other. But what I wanna do, if we look at the center of the robot, okay? What I wanna is I want the red box on the left side. So I'm actually gonna make this a minus Y 400. And so that's gonna move the red box over there. So now we've got a center point right here where these two boxes meet. All right, and so uh, I'm gonna double click on the red box here and make sure I lock it, okay. And then I'm gonna add one more fixture, which is going to be a cylinder. And I'm just gonna make this a blue cylinder. So I'm gonna select the blue color and I'm going to set the cylinder to 1400, 200, and one hundred. And I'm going to set the uh, yaw to be ninety. And I'm going to set the diameter here to be, and these are all values I have in the lab, okay? And so what that does is that's going to, and I'll lock that in place. So I have this blue circle right here um, in front of the robot. And actually it has one edge touching the brown box and one edge touching the red box, okay? So we're gonna be doing this in, in the lab uh, for lab day for the robo guide. So I'm just kind of working through that. Now, what I wanna do is I want to go through here and create a program. So I'm gonna open up my teach pendant. And to create a program, the first thing we do is we choose the select button. So we go to select, and these are all the programs currently on this robot. But if you notice here at F2, the soft key F2, it says create. So if I press F2 or click on create, I can now create a program. Okay, so this is, and it says it right here at the top, create teach pendant program. So we're gonna be creating this teach pendant program. So when, uh, to do this, um, we need to give it a name. All right, that's kind of, kind of the key thing to have a program, it needs to have a name. And they give us, when you, when you look here, it, uh, this little pop-up menu says words and the first choice for words is program, P-R-G. The, the, uh, another choice is main, sub, and test. In my opinion, these, these words are completely useless. I mean, P-R-G, it's a program. Well, come on, it, 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 it is a program. Why do you need to start the name with program? That doesn't even make sense to me, okay? So I'm not a big fan of using any of these words. Um, you're only you can only have so many characters in the program name. So wasting three or four of them on these words is kind of useless to me. You want to give it a more meaningful name. 
So I'm going to come down here. If we come down and we choose uppercase, then uh, I can select. Uh, uh, I like to use like my first initial uh, and then my last initial. And that's kind of what I, way I have you do it in lab. And by doing this, it'll keep all your programs together. Because when you look at the uh, listing of programs under the select, they're in alphabetical order. So if you always start them like with your initials, all of the programs that you create will be uh, together there, okay? And so what we do is we just use the uh, soft keys, F1 through F5, and to kind of cycle through. Now you can, for a program name, you can use um, letters, and you can use this underscore symbol, but you can't use like the at symbol, okay? So you see like this is listing the at symbol, but you're not allowed to use the at symbol for a program name. You can use it in other cases, but not for the program name. Uh, if you need to go backwards, you can do a backspace down here to go back. You can come and make it lowercase, but I would not bother with program names because with program names, when you hit press the select button, it always shows them as uppercase letters, no matter how you, whether you use lowercase letters in the name or not, it always displays them in the select screen as uppercase anyhow. So I don't bother messing with lowercase for program names. Now, later on, when we try to add comments or labels to different things, um, we can certainly use upper and lower case. Now, there's also the option down here of the keyboard. Okay. Now, the if it's an older robot, it doesn't have a touch screen, but you could plug in a USB keyboard into your teach pendant. On the newer robots, those actually have a touch screen. So you could actually come here and select the keyboard and then you can just type in what you want to name this, okay? So I'm just going to call this like rectangle. So HR, and then I threw in an underscore and rectangle, all right? And select exit. So there's my program. Now, once you've created the name, you have basically two choices here. You can either go directly to editing the program, or you can go into details, okay? So if you don't wanna mess with details, you can just go to edit, and now you're in a blank program, and you can start creating, uh, creating your program, all right? But I, now I skipped over the details. Well, you can always go back to the select screen, select your program, and then hit the next, Hit the next button here, and then you can view these details or make changes to these um, later on. All right, so the, uh, the name here, program name, is, uh, you know, if you want to change this, you just uh, go into the name and then press enter, and you can actually come in here and make a, a rename the program if you want. Okay, so you can rename it. Uh, after you've created it, if you decided you want to make some changes to the name. Okay. All right. Um, the next detail, well, actually at the very top, let me talk about the top. So up at the very top, they give us the creation date, the modification date, and the copy source. Now the copy source comes from, if you go to the select screen, right? Um, you one of the choices is to make a copy of your program. And so that would be the copy source, okay? So I'm not gonna make a copy right now, but uh, I just wanted to show that piece. All right, so now we come to types, okay? And there's basically three types of teach pendant programs. Um, the, so, We've, we've created a teach pendant program. That's what this is. And so that means it's a program that tells a robot what to do. And it was created using the teach pendant. That's what that means. Now, given that, there's a, we can have a subtype. So a subtype of none means that this is just an ordinary teach pendant program that you can run by going to select and selecting it and then telling it to run the program. 
Okay. But if you click on this, you see that there's a couple of other options. One of the options are macro, and one of them is a conditional program. And so these, these are still teach pendant programs, which means that you could select them with the select button and execute them with no issues. But they also have some other uh, uh, features that if you select the, these subtypes, there's other features that'll have. Now for the macros, there's a whole chapter on macros it's, I uh, forget here, let me look at the book. It's like way, way near the end of the book. It's like um, chapter 16, okay? So we're on chapter 10 right now. So we've got a few chapters to get to the macros, but um, you know, this is how you would set it as a type of macro. All right, so for right now, we're just gonna leave that none until we get to chapter 16. Okay, we can add an extra comment of the program. Now in this comment, you can use uppercase, lowercase spaces and other punctuation stuff where we couldn't use it in the name of the program. And then we have something called the group mask, right? So back in the alarms chapter, we talked about how we have, uh, we have eight groups and you inside of these eight groups, you can have up to six axes or not six, nine axes um, uh, or, or servos that are being controlled. So the six, where I got the six from was we have our six built right into the robot, right? So your robot by default has got six axes and all six of these axes belong to group one, all right? But what the group mask here means is it identifies number one, which axes, uh, which group of axes this program will move. But if I put a star in here, what that says is that this program will not move the robot. It may open um, or close grippers or other um, actuators, but it will not move the robot. Okay, so if you want this program to actually allow the robot or in, uh, to instruct the robot to move, you need to make sure that group mask one, uh, the group, the first group mask is set to a one. So notice here, there's, there's uh, eight of these because we have eight groups. Now by default, right, the robot just comes with group one and it's six axes. And so in the classroom, we don't have any other axes on any other group set up, all right? So that would have to be set up outside of it before you could select group two or group three or so on. All right, we can also uh, flag the uh, file, the program as uh, write protect, meaning that if we write protect it, then we when we go in to select and try to delete, then it it will refuse to delete it. And so we have to like come in here and take write protect off before we can go delete it. Okay. Uh, there's also an, an ignore pause. So remember there's the hold button here. You can press the hold button while a program is running and it will pause. Okay, but if you tell it to ignore that, if you turn that on, then it will ignore the hold button. And then the, the very last option here is what they call the stack size, which is kind of the how much memory is needed for the program to run. Normally, we don't need to mess with that. Um, if it needs to increase that, it does it automatically. I've never had an issue where I had to kind of come in here and manually adjust the stack size. But those are the details for a program. So again, once we've done that, the program is there. We can click end, um, press edit, and now we're inside of our program. So here's our program. It basically has one line, which is the end of the program. So now what I wanna do here is I wanna create a program that's going to go around this red box, this red, rectangle that I put here. And so 
And I want to do that using my pointer to be perfectly parallel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to data, position registers, okay? And I'm going to record my current position. So you notice here's position register one, and it's empty. And I'm going to record it into my current position, okay, which is basically the mastered position. Because when you first create a work cell using RoboGuide, it's like you just bought the robot and it came from the factory. And when it comes from the factory, it is in its mastered position. And so when we look at position here, you can see these numbers, but what I wanna look at is joint representation. So you can see that all the joints are at zero. Okay. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna punch in on J5 minus 90 and then say done. And now I'm gonna do a shift move to. Okay, and it's not gonna move that way. Should All right, so what it's doing here is it, it doesn't want to allow the robot to move because it's in that singularity. So remember to get out of a singularity, what you need to do is jog axis J5. So that's what I did was I kind of jogged axis J5 to get out of that singularity. All right, but now if we look at this position, all right, so this is my current position, right? If we look in joint mode, we see my current position and you see that it's all zeros except for J5, which is 90. And basically what that means, well, minus 90. And what that means is that this pointer is now perpendicular. So it's pointing straight down, okay? So now I can use um, in the software here, it's kind of nice because we can actually just click on the pointer and drag it, or we can um, go to world mode, okay? And, you know, instruct the robot to move, right? And so we can move it down and whatever, but um, we I know I have it perpendicular because I started out by setting that angle, okay? And so when this comes down, Okay, if we look at it in the world view, we see that uh, an angle of J5 of minus 90 is equivalent to a yaw of 180, right? But you can see that, you know, here's my pointer coming down. And in the software, we can actually just kind of click on this and, and drag the pointer around even, okay? But uh, so if you look at this, right? So if you look at this, it looks like I'm right here where these two boxes meet. However, if you rotate it around, you see that I'm nowhere near where those boxes meet, okay? And this is why it's so important in this software to use the multi-views so that you can look at a view and say, what I wanna do is I wanna get this pointer to the tip where the brown and red boxes meet. And so, you know, we can drive that over there and so on, but you really need to look at it from multiple views to know that you, you're there, okay? So, because I'm looking here and depending on how zoomed in you are, um, I'm still quite a ways away from that, okay? So you see, I mean, when I was looking at it from here and I thought, boy, that looks right on. But if I rotate it around, I'm still nowhere close to that value. So you need to make, make full use of the software to get the robot as close as possible to these points. And the other thing you can do is you can use your values, okay? So, all right, if you look at this here, if I back away, right, I'm still way away in the Y direction. However, 
I know where these boxes are at. Okay, so I put this brown box. Okay, this brown box is 400 in the X direction. And I put it at 1000 millimeters. So that means that this point here is actually because the box, the, remember the marker is in the center of the box, which means to get to the, the edge facing us, I got to go 200 millimeters. Okay, so that means that it was at 1000 plus another 200 millimeters because the the numbers we're looking at here in this box where it says 1,400 and 200 is based on being the center of the top of that box. And so I need to adjust that. So what we can do, we can actually be very precise by going and uh, punching in the numbers. So if I come over here, I can punch in, this needs to be 1,200. Okay, and this needs to be zero because I want it to be dead center. All right, and then you can click on move to and the robot will move right to that point. Now, the only problem with this is the Y is not quite as obvious. Okay, so we, we just kind of need to zoom it down because the problem with calculating the Y is Y is based on the world position of the robot, which is up here. But then we need to know exactly how far, because the boxes are measured from the floor, okay? And so it's a little bit confusing there. So the Y is a little harder, but the X and the Z, or X and the Y, excuse me, the X and the Y, we can target directly, okay? But uh, so uh, I know that my X and Y are exact now. And then I can just kind of come in here and I can get this as close as possible to that. All right, so now once I've done that, that is my starting point, okay? And so um, this is where, um, you know, this, this is where these points meet, okay? And so, I want this to be a point in my program. So to add it to my program, I'm gonna come over to edit and I'm gonna do shift point. Okay, so now I've added this point to the program. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna to go to the other end here where Y is gonna be, the only thing that's gonna change here is the Y value. And I can just drive the robot over here and mark that value. Now, again, when you do that, okay, you know that Y is supposed to be 800, okay? So if I do shift point again, I've now added that point. Okay? Likewise, I can then drive it up here now if we're you know if we're working on a real robot we can't just drag it so what we have to do is just use the uh, the teach pendant and adjust it okay and when you start getting close you may want to slow the uh, slow it down a little bit. Okay, I'm at 1% and it still seems to be moving really fast here. All right, but, um, and then we move the X, okay. Okay, right there to that point. And again, you need to zoom in on it and just make sure that, that you're right there where you should be. All right, and so then we'll come back to our program and I'm gonna do shift point and this is gonna be my third point. Okay. And then I want to go over here to this point of the box. 
Okay, so what I want to do is just go around the box. So I'm, I'm teaching the robot these points. Okay, uh, so I'm teaching it the edges of the box. And again, it, um, I should be at 1600 and Y should be at zero. So it's pretty close. It's a little bit off, but very, very slight error. Okay, so if I wanted to force it, I could force it um, to that value. Okay, if I'm on the real robot, I, I don't have this position thing where I can just punch in numbers and, you know, like here we can just punch in a, a Y value of, you know, like 50 or whatever and hit enter and it'll just move. All right, so I can't do that um, on the real robot, but what I can do is I can come to a position register and I can come in here and I can do a shift record and record the current position. All right, now, right now it's displaying it as joints, but I wanna go back to Cartesian form. And now I can just punch in these numbers. So I can type in 1600 and make it exactly 1600. And then for the Y, it should be exactly zero. All right, and so if I do that, then I know it's gonna be very accurate and I can do a shift move to then, and it will move to that point. And so it just moves immediately to that point now. All right. And then we press edit. And I'm going to do a shift point to add that point. So now I've got my four points, but I want to go around the entire box. Okay. So I want to go around the entire box, which means I need to end up back at point one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press shift point one more time, which gives me a point five. But Point 0.5 is exactly the same as point 0.4. You notice the at symbol? The at symbol tells us that we are currently at that point. So we are at point 0.4 and we are at point 0.5 because I hit shift point on both locations. But what I can do is I can use my arrow keys. So I can come over here with my arrow keys and arrow in here where it says P5 and I can put a one in there. Okay. And so then we have our one, two, three, four, one. Okay. So now to test this program, I'm going to hit my step button we talked about. And you notice the step button here it has the red lines. That means it's going to stop at each line in the program. Okay. So I arrowed up here to the beginning. And I'm going to press shift. You got to hold down the shift and the dead man and press forward and it moves to that point. So now it's telling you that it's at point one. And then if I press forward again, it moves to point two. Okay. And in this software, it moves really fast, right? Because it's running, notice it's running at 100% speed. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. But if I press forward again, it moves to point three, then it moves to point four, and then it returns to point one. Okay, so this is a teach pendant program view. We went in, we hit select, and we went to create. So we pressed F2 to create. If it wasn't showing, then we had to use the next button here to toggle back and forth till we got to the word create and we just click on create, give it a name and um, we've created the program, all right? But then once we've created the program, um, we select it on the select screen, hit enter and make it active. It tells you up here, you see right here where my mouse is, HR underscore rectangle. So it tells you the name of the selected program. And so all I have to do now is uh, press, um, or uh, I, I can come in here and I can just add these points, okay? Now there's a couple of things that I left out when I created this uh, program. All I did was add points to the program. So, well, before I get to those, I'll come back to those in a little bit. But before I do that, so now I've showed you how you can step through, right? So you hit the step button and you get these red bars in the step 
flag. And so now when you uh, press forward, it runs, executes one instruction and then stops. That's what step means. However, if I hit step again, what it'll do is it'll run through the program. You hit forward and it runs through the whole program, okay? So here I am, it, it runs, um, I'm at the beginning of the program, I press forward, it runs, it goes to point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, you know, and it does that so fast. I'm gonna slow it way down now. Okay, I'm gonna slow it down to 1% and hit uh, forward again. And now we can actually sort of watch it move. Okay. Now, uh, it's interesting when you watch it move, it's not along the edge, okay? Now there, it kind of looks like it's at the edge, but not maybe not quite. So as we watch it, now, Uh, hold on just a minute, please. Call from three, three, zero, two, three, two, one. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I usually don't answer them, but that one looked like it was important. So I gave it to my daughter to talk to. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyhow, so um, I let go of the shift key and, the, and it stopped. Okay, so if you look at the program here, there's no at symbols because it's not at any of the four points of my program. Okay, and so if I... Uh, if I now hold down my shift key and my dead man, if it was the real robot and hit forward, it'll just continue on. But, you know, if we, as we look down on this, you know, it, it's like, whoa, it's getting further and further away from the box. But as it gets closer to the point, it actually comes and it ends at that point, okay? So um, that is what we call the joint motion, okay? So if you notice here, you see the J's, okay? The J's are joint motions. And so it's not moving in a straight line, okay? Uh, it's kind of like if you take your own um, hand and let's say that I have like this rod here. Okay, so, all right. So here is this rod. And if I'm gonna, you know, I've got my finger on the tip here and I wanna move it to the other end. Well, if you were gonna do this, you would naturally just, you know, lift your arm and kind of arc over to it, right? That's kind of a natural motion, okay? Um, you know, the other option would be to go in a straight line, but if you go in a straight line, you got to, you got to keep your hand there. You got to kind of twist and, and whatever to keep, keep the tip of your finger on it that entire way. That's more work. It takes more effort to do it that way. Okay. And uh, so a linear motion is, is a lot of extra work. So a joint motion just is like, okay, I'm just, I'm here. I want to go over here. Okay. I'm not worried about how I get there. I'm just going to the, I'm going to this point. I don't care where I'm just going there. Okay. And so, so that is a joint motion. So that's what the robot is doing. When we make this, uh, when we, when we watch it, we see, you know, right now, if you look at this, it's right there. In the program, you can you can be in the middle of the program because I was like right now I'm between points two and three in the program, but I stopped it and I moved back. Now, because I changed what line to start on, it gives me this warning because when you if you don't start in the expected location, 
it's very possible that the robot may run into something because these motion instructions tell it where to go, but they don't tell it where to start from. And so they, they're assuming they, you know where they're starting from and that you're not gonna hit anything on along the way. All right, so if I say yes here now, it'll uh, start moving. Well, actually I, I, I say yes, and then I gotta hit forward again to get it to actually start moving. All right, and so now here it is moving and you can see that it's just not going in a straight line at all. Okay, it's arcing around. So here we are, we're at point one, and then we're going over to point two. So I'm going over here to point two, but I sure didn't go in a straight line to get there. Okay. All right, so, um, but that's how we can test the program using either step or take step off. Now, in the RoboGuide software, to run the pro robot in auto mode, what you have to do is press the play button up here in the RoboGuide software. So if I run, if I go and run this uh, cycle start, okay, they give you something about timing because it's a s virtual software, right? But as you do this, you can see this is the path that it took to go around the box, all right? And so it's kind of cool in this software because you can see they're actually showing you the path that it took okay, to, to make and travel like that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to change the speed from 100 down to, say, 10%. Um, to do that, you have to turn the teach pen it back on to make edits. Okay, so I'm just going to change these speeds to 10% here. So we can change this information. Okay, when we're in teach mode, we can't do it if we're in run mode and full auto mode. So um, so if I when I run this. Okay. Did you have a question there? Or... Okay. All right. So when I um, when I run this again, okay, you can see it it ran. It it didn't actually it doesn't look like it really changed it too much. It just followed that same path there. Okay. So um, but we can change the speeds on this now. Um, a couple of things that we should really, really do before we st uh, at the beginning of our program. All right. So in this case, all I did was just tell it to start at this corner and go around the rectangle. And that was it. That was my program. But there's three, um, three major instructions we should tell it. And those two of those come from what we talked about last week with frames. So what we want to do, we, you know, before we actually start teaching these, we had to teach our frames. We had to teach our user frame and we had to teach our tool frame. So now what we want to do is make sure, now those frames are being used, um, you know, if we do a shift chord here, we can see what frames we are using, okay? So we're using user frame zero, tool frame one. But, and, and we can also see that if we come over and we look at this point, we can hit position and we can see the point. We can see what frames, user frame and tool frame that the uh, point is using. And by the way, we can also make changes to these. Uh, we can change these numbers if we uh, decide to. We can just hard code numbers in there. Okay. All right. But... Uh, what we want to do is make sure that every time we run the program, it's set for the correct frame. So to do that, we have to add an instruction. However, if I come over here, I'm going to come over here and go to instruction. I'm going to come over to frame and I'm going to choose a frame. I'm going to set my user frame equal to a constant of User frame is user frame zero, which happens to be the world frame, which is the only one I have on this robot. 
okay? But what I want you to notice here is line one now says user frame and I lost because before it said line one was a joint motion going to point one and that's gone. I lost it, okay? I just, it's gone. We have one chance to recover it, okay? So if I uh, come back here, you see there's an edit command and under the edit command, there's an undo. And you can undo your last change, okay? You can't undo any other changes, just that very last change. There's only one undo. So if you did something, you're like, oops, I didn't want that. You got to undo it right now. You can't do, you know, add something else or change something else and then decide that you want to undo something two or three steps ago. All right, so, um, but what, what happens is when you hit this, this looks almost like me, like it says insert, but it's not insert, it's instruction, okay? And you can see it on the pop-up menu. These are instructions, not insert. So what that means is if you do something here, it overwrites what you had, okay? Now, so if we need to insert some lines, you hit edit command over here, F5, edit command, and we're gonna insert. So I select number one, insert, and I'm gonna insert three lines. No, four lines. I'm gonna insert four lines because I'm missing four things from the beginning of this program. So the first thing I want then is my user frame instruction. So I'm gonna come to user frame. Notice you gotta select a constant and then you can punch in the number. Then I'm going to go back to frames and I'm going to choose my tool frame. So I'm going to go user tool num and that's going to be the constant and that's tool one. Now, how do I know that? Again, if I come over here to this point and look at it, this point was taught for user frame zero and user tool one. Then we have our payload. I talked a little bit about payloads. That was in chapter eight. Okay, um, they have payloads. And so to set a payload, you have to go to menu, next, system. And then remember we had to, there's no payload under here. You have to choose motion, all right? And then here you can choose motion um, or under motion, these are your payloads. And then we can come into our payload and we can set the weight of our, our, that we're carrying around what the mass is in kilograms. And then we can also set our center of gravity and our moments of inertia, okay? So we have to set those up in our payload. Once we do that inside our program, we just have to tell it which payload we're currently moving. And so we come again to instruction, come over to payload, and we're just gonna set a payload. I'm just gonna put in payload one right now. And usually uh, payload one is kind of your default payload. And then the other thing is right now, the robot is starting and ending right here at the face of your box that you're trying to work on. And so it's really a good idea to always start the robot out above up up in a safe area okay so what we need is a home point so i'm going to come over here i'm going to take the robot and i'm going to jog it up so i'm in world so i'm going to do plus z and i'm just going to jog it up here some that was a little bit too far um i'm back up to 100 percent speed you got to watch this when you go to auto mode it automatically jumps to 100 percent speed on you and uh which is kind of annoying at times because it moves so fast. Okay, so I'm gonna slow my speed back down so I can then jog the robot down. So I just wanna be above my workspace, okay? Now you notice these traces, Here's, here are these traces when I did that auto mode. You can actually um, come over here, those show up, or on this left-hand side in the work cell. And you can actually right click on that 
and delete it. And that'll get it off the screen if it bothers you, okay? Actually, I can't quite get the bottom of my, there it is. Okay, scroll over here. What you wanna do is um, you can just, uh, it's part of your profile. And uh, if, you know, it, it gives a date and time of when the program was run like that. And you can just delete that whole piece and, and it'll disappear. All right, now the blue line that is there is just showing you what you currently have in your program. So this is just showing me, here's my program and there's where your various points are at. But now what I wanna do is I wanna add one more point, which is going to be my uh, home point, okay? It's kind of a safe area up here to start the program in, okay? So I'm gonna do a shift, I'm gonna hit the next key so I get the word point there and I'm gonna do a shift point, okay? And that's point five. And I'm gonna label that as home. So I'm gonna come over here to the number. I'm gonna press enter. And I can actually just come in here and go to keyboard and type in home. So this is my home point, okay? And then I'm going to point two, three, four, back to point one. And then I want to go back to point the home point. So I'm going to do shift F1 again and come over here and make that point five again. Okay. So now this, this is kind of a complete program to go around. I mean, it worked just fine before, but these additions just kind of make it a smoother program. Okay. And so when I run this, I do a shift forward and it's gonna come down. Okay, right now my teach pendant is turned on. So I'm, I'm just testing the program and we can see that it's moving. And running through the program and it's gonna come back to the home point or a point, it's a point four, point um, one, and then back to point five. Okay, so it just um, goes through all those um, points and just executes the program. Again, we can run it in auto mode by coming up here and the, hitting the play button for cycle start. And then we can just kind of watch it uh, traverse through. And again, it's not actually going in a straight line because it's in joint motion. So that's why it's doing this curve, curved motion here because it's in joint motion. Now, if I wanted it to follow a straight line, I could come over here where it says J and go to choice and I could choose linear. Okay, so I could come down here and choose linear. Um, again, no, notice the error message, teach pendant is disabled. Every time, every time you hit cycle start, it automatically shuts off your teach pendant. I always forget that. So um, that you can't make changes to the program if the teach pendant is off. So that's what it was doing. So I was kept trying to put an L in there and it, it would look, pop up the menu, but it wouldn't let me choose it. All right, so notice here, I'm just gonna put L's, press the number two, okay? Choice two, choice, F4 choice two, F4 choice two. All right, and now what I'm doing is I'm telling it to move in a linear motion. Okay, now I don't really care about the home to point one. I'm going to leave those as joints. But as I go around the box now, I want it to trace out a perfectly straight line. And I'm just going to go ahead and hit my cycle start here again and watch it. And you can see now it's moving right along the edge of my rectangle in a nice straight line.
All right. And so that is a linear motion. So when we look, we have um, multiple choices here for uh, motions. We have joint, which is just a natural arm movement kind of motion, which it puts less stress on the robot. Okay. So when you can, it's a nice idea to use joint motions because they allow the robot to move in a more uh, a less stressful uh, way. It actually uses less energy and, and basically just less stresses on the servos and on the arm of the robot, okay? But if you needed to move in a straight line, that's what linear is for. And the other choice is circular. I'll get into circular here in a little bit. All right, so when we look at this, the line five here is called a motion instruction. Okay, all, you know, lines four through 10 are all motion instructions. And the first information in there is the motion type, linear, joint, or circular. The next um, thing is the point or the position where you're going to move to. So the motion instruction says you're going to move. Uh, uh, you know, you're the robot. Um, I'm telling you, you know, I'm instructing you to move to this location. So the P1, P2, P3, these are the points where you're going to move to. So you're instructing it to move to these locations. Okay. Now, these five points in this program are completely different than if I was to go to another program and have a point one, point two, point three. So these points um, are unique in this program. You have a P1, um, and if I go create a brand new program, if I come over here, create a new program, you know, and just um, call it something, I don't know, whatever. Okay, and I create this new program and I put a point in here. Teach pendant is disabled on me again. This P1 here is completely different than the P1 here. Okay, they're completely different. There's nothing about them that have any association. However, um, when we look at these points, if we come over to choice, you have two choices. One is a point, the other is a position register. Now, I already showed you at the beginning of the lecture here that we can record locations and these would be like position registers. So for instance, let me just like take this um, robot here let me jog this guy so i'm just going to move him over here somewhere i don't know where right there i guess and i'm going to record this as my current location okay and so i recorded this point and now what i'm going to do here is come back to my program. And instead of going from point five, which is at home point to point one, I'm gonna to come to this position register. Now let's see, I saved that in position register one. So I'm gonna to come to choice and I'm gonna choose PR and then I'm gonna tell it position register one, okay? And what it's going to do then is it's going to move. So when I run this program, it's gonna move over there to that position register, then go over to point two and go through the rest of the program. All right, so your point that you're gonna to move to can either be a point or it can be a position register. Now, if it's a position register, that position register can be modified by other programs and used by other programs, all right? The other thing to note about position registers is if you, note, if you come in here and you look at the position, notice it says user frame is F, 
and user tool is F. I'm not quite sure what the letter F exactly stands for, but what that means is your current frame. So if, if you have, if you're using position register number one in our current program, which is using frame one, and then you use uh, position register one in a different program that's using frame user frame two, those two, even though they're the exact same numbers on this screen, when you look at it, there are two completely different points because they're based on your frame of reference. And if the frames are different, then they're different points, which is really weird. So you need to be very careful when you're using position registers that you know which frame it's been set for, okay? And that it's been set for the frame that your program is running in. Otherwise you could crash into something very easily. Usually what'll happen is you'll get some, I can't get there sort of error message. You'll get some sort of motion error and the program just won't move. Okay, if your uh, position register is too far out of reach. Okay, so, uh, but that's how you can set that. So we have their point um, or position register. Now, here is the speed. Okay, so you see this one here. Um, uh, this, let me come back. This is a joint motion. And so if we look at choices, Okay, uh, we can move at a percent speed. So 100% means we're going to move as fast as this robot can possibly move. Now, remember, when you're in teach mode, even though the robot can technically move faster, it will only move at 250 millimeters per second because that's all it's allowed to move in teach mode. Okay, we can also give an instruction called second. So I can tell it to take 10 seconds to go from where you are, wherever you may be, to the point that you're moving to, okay? So like right now, um, we're moving to point five. So um, because, the, you know, this is, uh, I'm saying go to point five, which I'm currently at point five, but um, the instruction is saying move to point five and, you know, take 10 seconds to get there, all right? And so, you know, if, if it's only a couple millimeters away, then, you know, it's still going to take it 10 seconds on there. So that's kind of interesting. Or you can go to choice and you can actually tell it takes so many milliseconds, right? And that's one one thousandth of a second. Right? So you can uh, specify that. Now, notice that the linear has an option 200 millimeters per second. But we didn't see that listed for the joint. Joint, okay, and this is a test question. Joint, you can only do percent, second, or millisecond. On the other hand, if we come down to the linear motion, so if I come to linear motion here, and I want to um, set to speed, these are my choices. Now, notice down at the very bottom, I still have second and millisecond choices. But what I don't have is percentage, okay? So when you're doing a linear motion or you're doing a uh, circular motion, which we haven't really got yet, but the speeds are the same, you can do millimeters per second, centimeters per minute, inches per minute, or degrees per second, okay? Those are your choices for setting speeds. All right, so now let's say that uh, I set this speed to, I want it to go one meter, right? One meter is 1000 millimeters. Okay, so let's say that um, between 0.5 on line four is, you know, gonna be a 0.5 and line five is gonna be a 0.1. And let's just say for sake of argument that there is 1000 millimeters before between 0.5 and 0.1, there's 1,000 millimeters. It's one meter to go from 0.5 to 0.1. And we're going to go in a nice linear line, straight line. And I'm going to go at a speed of 1,000 millimeters per second. All right. So given that, does somebody want to tell me 
Um, can, can somebody tell me the, uh, how long it's gonna take, okay? So I'm going from 0.5 to 0.1 and they're 1,000 millimeters away and I'm running at a speed of 1,000 millimeters per second. Okay. All right, so um, I, I thank you for answering. Okay, um, one second, that sounds correct. Okay, so, uh, cause I'm basically saying I'm gonna go 1000 millimeters and I'm gonna go at a speed of 1000 millimeters per second. It should take one second, right? Sounds kind of obvious, but um, we forgot one thing. If we started from a, a speed of zero, then we need to speed up, okay? So it's actually going to take it a little bit more than a second because there's an acceleration time. We're going to have to wait for it to accelerate and then have wait for it to decelerate um, if we're going to stop. OK, so when we when we are starting from a dead stop, we have to speed up to get up to that speed. And so there's an acceleration time. Likewise, when. Uh, if we're gonna stop at, at that point, then we're gonna to have to decelerate so we can stop at that point. And so it's actually gonna take a little bit longer than a second, okay? So, um, you know, the, your, your first guess uh, was close, but you gotta keep in mind that it's actually gonna, there's some acceleration time that's gonna to have to be calculated in there. Okay, so um, given that, um, that pretty much covers the speed. The only other thing um, to look at is this one. Well, actually, there's, there's five things here. Okay, the first thing we have here is called um, the motion type, and then we have the position, then we have the speed or the velocity that it's going to move at, and then we have the termination. Okay, so that's four. But there's actually five things. If we come over here, we can add what's called an option. And you can actually add several options to the same line, OK? But um, this one here, fine, means termination. If you say fine, what that means is it's actually going to stop at that point, OK? So. Um, Fine means that it's going to come to a complete stop and stop at this point before it speeds back up and goes to the next point. Our other option is called continuous, okay? So if you do a continuous, now um, continuous here, let me change these all to continuous here. Okay, continuous means that you're not going to stop. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to clear out. No, I'm, I guess I'll leave it there. So remember this, this blue line that is here right now, it shows that it, it moved in a linear straight line from point one all the way up to point two, and then over to point three, right? So it mapped out the, the rectangle perfectly. But now I'm going to put continuous um, and I'm, I'm just going to make it continuous 10 right now. Okay, this is basically like a percentage. You can do a continuous um, 0, 1, all the way up to 100. Okay, and so I'm going to make it a 10 right now. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to run this. And what I want you to see that as I run this, Okay. It's going to map this out, but when it gets to this corner, okay, it kind of veers off. It actually didn't stop. And so notice this corner is a little bit rounded. Okay. So you notice that corner is rounded. So it didn't go right to that corner, but it actually rounded off at that corner a little bit, but not a lot. Okay. 
But now if we go back and we put in, uh, say, 50, and again, turn the teach pendant back on, 50, hello. Okay, so if we go to 50 here, and I'm gonna run this again now, you're gonna see that it actually uh, rounds it off a little bit more. Okay. okay, and so you can see, oops, it, it really is kind of rounding that off. And if we go all the way up to 100, Okay. It's going to round it off even more. So let me try this one more time here. So now what this means is that 100 continuous 100 means it's not even going to slow down. Okay. So it's going to go toward that point, but you can see there that it's rounded off. Okay. Because what it's doing is it's good. It's not even slowing down. It's just cruising right on by. Now I slowed my speeds way down. So let's increase our speeds. The faster your speed is, the further away you're gonna be. So, you know, if you look there, and that one doesn't display too well the color that they chose on that one, right? And that rounded there. But if I run this again, oh, <laughs> it looks like it totally missed 0.2 and 0.3. Look at that, how it just rounded those completely off, okay? So by running at a different speed, how much it rounded is dramatically different. Okay. So you see how, see that, I mean, it, it didn't even get to this outer edge here. It rounded it so much, okay? And if we throw in on top of that joint motions, We go back to joint motions. Okay. And run this one more time. running <laughs> it's supposed to be wrapping out a rectangle and <laughs> it looks like i don't know a kidney bean or something there okay so um so it's important to understand here when you select different um pieces of an instruction motion that you understand what those do. Because if there was an object in the way, if there was an object in the middle here, right up in here, I would have hit that object as opposed to going around the out circumference of the box. Okay. So uh, any questions about those? Those are the standard motion instructions. Okay. Now, um, the only other thing I haven't talked about is a circular motion. So let me talk about that. That's why I have this uh, blue cylinder on here so we can go around that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna clear out 
these profiles okay to just kind of clean the screen off a little bit so notice here that um, this circle is touching um, right here so it's 200 millimeters out from where i'm at at point one so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn step on Let's see, turn my teach pendant on, turn step on. I'm gonna come up here to this line, which takes me to point one, and I'm gonna to move to that point. And then I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna add a new point, which I want to be a circular point. But before I do that, I'm going to, um, this is point six, okay? And uh, so this is my starting point. So um, this is gonna put me on the circle. Okay, so this, uh, and I'm gonna get there with a joint motion. Okay, so when you ever, you know, anytime you draw a circle, it's something that we don't think about, but if you're gonna draw a circle, it, you know, you have to get there to draw it. So like, for instance, if we take a look at this here piece of paper, if I wanted to draw a circle on this piece of paper, before I can actually draw, I got to get the pencil to the piece of paper. So once I'm there, I'm at the beginning of the circle. And then I can start drawing the circle. So that's what we're doing here. So this is uh, here. I'm going to press enter here. I can label these points, right? So I'm going to come down here, select my keyboard. Keyboard. And, and this is um, get to start a point. And I could have left spaces in there, I guess, or something. But this uh, start of point. That was supposed to be point. Get to the start of a circle, actually. Get to the start of the circle. Okay. So we want to get to the start of the circle. To do that, you need to use something other than a joint motion. All right. Now, this start of the circle needs to be 200 millimeters out. So I need to go to 1400 here, not 1200, okay? So that, um, so now I'm going to come over here. Notice you got to arrow over to the line number to get it to move forward. And I'm gonna just move this, okay? And it knows that I'm doing it out of line. So I got that yes answer there. All right, so did it not take my change? Okay, one, four, zero, zero. I think I forgot to hit enter. Okay, and then done. All right, so now I'm gonna try moving there again. Shift forward. Okay, so now I'm, I'm on the circle. But I got to the circle using a joint motion, not a circular motion. Now I want to go around the circle. So what I'm going to do is I need to move over to this to, to basically 90 degrees. Okay. And, you know, we can kind of drag it around here in the software if you want. Just do it very quickly. Or you can punch in the numbers because you know what these numbers are. Okay. And so this is going to be my first point in the circular. So I'm gonna say shift point, okay? Now that I've done a shift point, I'm gonna change this point to circular, all right? But notice when it do, did that, it wants a second point also, all right? So now I need to draw drive it uh, basically 180 degrees in the circle. So notice that, that the type isn't circle. It's circular, 
Okay, and so what that means is that this is mapping out basically half a circle, not the whole circle. So if you wanted to go all the way around, you have to do it twice. You need, because the circle uh, is 360 degrees, but the circular only does about half of them. So now notice here, I moved it 180 degrees, and then I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna do a shift touch up. So I'm going to save this point. Okay. So now before I do anything else, I'm just going to come over and walk through this. So we're going to go home. So I'm going to come up to line 10, which is going home. It's going to say, do I want to do this? And I'm going to say yes. And then I hit forward It moves home. It moves down to the start of the circle. Then it moves around half of the circle and then around the other half, okay? So if I take this and I'm gonna take step off and I do this, and of course it's gonna ask me yes there again. So see, it changed my speed back to 100%. So it's moving so fast there. So let's try it one more time here. Shift forward. Okay. Um, I just want to rearrange my view a little bit so we can see it here. And I'm going to run this. Okay, so we're going home. We're going to the circle. Now we're on the circle. Now that we're on the circle, we're going around the circle. Well, we're only doing about 180 degrees. So now we're already on the circle. So I can do a point, make it a circular one. So I'm gonna make this a circular point. Okay, and that's point nine, but that's not where I'm starting because I'm starting at point eight. So point nine now needs to go the rest of the way around the circle. So I'm gonna come over here about 90 degrees, which is right where the blue and brown boxes line up. Okay, and I'm going to do a touch up here and say, remember that value. Now, we need to return back to the starting point to make the complete circle. Well, the starting point was 0.6. So I don't have to move there. I can just go say, go to 0.6. Okay, and I can just punch that in and it'll go to 0.6. I'm going to change my speeds and slow them down again so we can watch this when we uh, run full auto. Okay, so I'm going to slow it down so I can run full auto and watch this run. Okay, but before I go to full auto, anytime, don't, don't always go to full auto. You want to first test it in step mode and then uh, with step off. So I'm just going to arrow back up here to 0.5, go home. And then I'm going immediately down to the circle. And then I'm going around the circle. Okay. All right. So now if we run the entire program, the first thing it's going to do is go around the box, and then it's going to go around the blue circle. And then I really should return home again, but I don't think I'm going to do that for now. I'll just leave it go. All right, so we went around the box, and now we're going around the circle. All right, so that is the motion instructions um, for the types joint, linear, and circular. And the only other thing is, right, I mentioned here we can add an option. So these options here, um, we come over to the very end of the motion instruction, and then we can add options. And um, Later on, we'll use like offsets. Those are probably the most common ones to be used, but we won't get into that uh, for a couple more chapters yet, okay? But uh, we can add various uh, options here. Um, and other things we can do is like um, things like time before or time after. So we can 
uh, tell it to like, before we get to that point, turn on a grinder. They say that our robot is, is a grinding machine. So it's got a grinding wheel or something. And so as we start getting near, we can tell it to turn the grinder on. So it's up to full speed before we actually get to the object we're gonna grind, something like that. All right, so uh, any questions about any of this? Okay, um, well, I'm still trying to figure out what's gonna happen for Wednesday. I mean, we were supposed to do a lab, but um, I'm waiting to hear back to make sure I do not have COVID. And um, if I do have COVID, then obviously I won't be there Wednesday. I'm looking to see if I can get somebody to cover, but um, there's only one person I know of who, who would possibly be able to cover the class, and I don't know if they're available um, on Wednesday. So please keep an eye on Blackboard, and I will uh, post uh, a message. And so we'll either have another Zoom lesson and uh, then do labs when I get back, hopefully next Wednesday. Remember, next Monday is a holiday, so we don't have class anyhow. Um, so, um, but I'll uh, just keep an eye on Blackboard and I'll try to keep you up to date, okay? And if you have any questions, meanwhile, shoot me an email. And if we need to, we can always do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom or something, okay? All right. So, um, well, have a good evening and uh, talk to you guys later.